Good afternoon. You're watching GB News. I'm Nana Aquir. It is the week. Now, joining us now is uh, GB News Head of Digital, Becca Hudson, to talk us through some of the top stories performing online this morning. So, uh, Becca, what, what do we start with? Well, it Unsurprisingly, our kind of digital output has been dominated by the two really big stories of the week, so obviously the, the tragic shootings in Plymouth and the increasingly alarming situation in Afghanistan. And yesterday on Alice Stewart and Friends, we were able to talk to Imran Ahmed, who is from the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, about this incel phenomenon, which is this sort of misogynist ideology um, that seemingly hundreds of thousands of men across the world sign up to and... Um, it's about this, it's sort of this digital community um, on mainstream platforms like YouTube and Reddit, but also on kind of dark net, deep net, um, kind of more encrypted platforms as well. And we spoke to him about why social media platforms aren't doing more to counter incels. Let's take a look. I find it inexplicable as to why mainstream platforms, which are frequented by our children, and in which their vulnerabilities may be exploited for grooming by incels, that they are allowed to remain on those platforms in breach of their own community guidelines. Mm. I mean, it took YouTube 18 hours to remove the channel um, where Jake Davidson was uploading um, videos with all manner of, of, of hateful um, hateful content is it is it a technology is it that they don't get detected by the algorithms or the systems that YouTube use to protect the community or is it um, a kind of deeper rooted issue whereby these platforms don't take the incel movement seriously enough as a threat uh, I mean in that period my team went to his YouTube channel and recorded the glorification of his violence by other users. We took screenshots, we took detailed notes. Those, of course, have been passed on to British law enforcement as well as uh, they've been made public over the past uh, day or so. YouTube clearly have more staff than the Center for Countering Digital Hate has, given that they're a multi-billion dollar organization, and yet they left it up. Why they did that is really simple. They were the center of the story. They're an advertising business. Well, I mean, you know, the, even somebody else could go in and, and see the information and these... these yeah, exactly the point he's making. YouTube, with its sort of thousands and thousands of employees and seemingly kind of state-of-the-art technology, wasn't able to detect and remove that content that Jake Davison, um, the Plymouth shooter, uploaded. And we now know that kind of his actions are being kind of applauded and celebrated by other incels online. And so it really is this new problem. Well, it's not a new problem, actually. This phenomenon's been around for a really long time, but it has just seemingly gone kind of undetected or not taken seriously enough. And it it's ridiculous that it takes a mass shooting in this country for us to finally be having a conversation about incels. Yeah, and one of the points that Mr Ahmed raised was that you know, children could be exposed to this kind of content online. And I can't ham home often enough that parents need to take responsibility for what their children are seeing mm. online. We should not give children unfettered access to the internet because there are so many horrible things out there. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, and, and the thing is, although on this occasion it was to do with guns, Sometimes, as you, you pointed out earlier, it can be anorexia. There are lots of subjects that, you know, suicide. This has been going on for a long time. Mm. And we have passively allowed this to continue. And the only reason why there is any attention on this at the moment is because now we can actually see the result of what has happened and people, we can see that people are dying as a result of it. But big tech won't mm. do anything about it, will they? Mm. At the moment, it's just going to be, yeah. we'll, we'll get angry about it. Again, it's the media again. We've, we've got a slight problem with it. We'll just let the story go mm. away and then it'll happen again. Mm. But big tech will have got away with it. Mm. Absolutely, that's a point he made. Like, you know, they would have made, there's advertising to be made against this content. You know, it does really well. Um, you know, I can't imagine many brands would want to appear alongside yeah. some of the things Jake Davison was saying. But you're right, you know, these are commercial enterprises that they sort of social corporate responsibility is definitely a little lower down the list isn't it than the bottom line mm -hmm. for these for these giants um so it's a really interesting conversation with Imran Ahmed and, and you know something we should have been speaking about before and you're right we shouldn't neglect it just because you know this news cycle will move on mm. um shall I move on yeah well why not I mean um, she did that fabulous monologue didn't she well she did and this is um a really must watch Mercy's monologues have become a kind of appointment <laughs> to view <laughs> online amazing. they are wonderful aren't they and this was about um 
people trafficking. Um, it happened on the day that a migrant whose dinghy was capsized in the channel was then airlifted and subsequently died. And she was talking about how people traffickers see this country as a kind of free ride and prey on the most vulnerable people in the world to provide them with supposed free, safe passage into this country. And it's really worth having a look at. I can't think of a single reason why the price of death is worth paying for merely crossing from France, a safe, democratic, human rights respecting country, to Britain, a safe, democratic, human rights respecting country. And here's what else I think. I think that for the most part, the people crossing into this country through the channel are probably economic migrants. I also think that we're a laughing stock to people traffickers who, by the way, have this migrant's blood on their hands, who see Britain's shambolic inability to curb these crossings as a get rich quick scheme. More than 10,000 migrants have now successfully crossed into the UK. Just a week ago, a daily record was set for the number of migrants crossing, as 482 arrived in just one day. Those who suggest to have all the answers are either being daft, disingenuous or delusional. If the people who have been in charge for this for years and have both the money and power to make things happen can't even sort it out, then neither can migrant lobby groups who claim to have the answers. What I'm suggesting is that maybe, just maybe, a short-term pain, a long-term gain strategy is needed for now. Could I sleep at night knowing that from today, for example, we'd be sending migrants to an offshore processing centre? You know what? I could. Could I sleep at night knowing that from today we were saying, if you come here from France, your application for asylum will be automatically rejected? I could. I could if it means the measures would curb the problem in the short to medium term while France and Britain get its act together and figure out a long-term plan. I could live with that. Because quite frankly, I don't want more deaths in the channel. I don't want people smugglers to carry on profiting from misery. I don't want the UK to look like an incompetent soft-touch nation. After all, what's the worst that could happen? She's spot on. No, I love that. I love that. It's fantastic. She's absolutely spot on, right? Mm. I mean, we know we we know that if you are crossing from France, okay. So I understand the concept of being a refugee. You're a refugee because you are seeking refuge. Once you arrive in a safe place, mm -hmm. you can now claim asylum in that safe place, which is why you claim asylum in the place that you have landed. Mm. If you move from your safe place, you are now no longer a refugee because you are not running from persecution. And now you're about to take a perilous journey across the channel and risk death to get to another country. Why? This is why Mercy's monologues are so great. Well, it's true. Mainstream yeah. outlets will not cover this story. They won't. Uh, why are we not controlling our borders? You know, the government have been saying for years and years it's because of the EU. We can't control them. We left the EU. We still don't seem to be able to control our borders. Vulnerable people are being put at risk by these horrible people traffickers. And... What are we doing about it? What is the Home Secretary doing about it? That's what I want to know. Why are we paying for expensive hotels? Why are we letting the boats come over and holding onto the boats in case the traffickers want them back? We should be turning people away and not letting them cross the channel at all. I've also got that horrible feeling that, and I think Nigel Farage has said it a few times, mm. and Mercy touched on it there, she doesn't want any more fatalities. But luckily, there hasn't been that many fatalities mm. so far in the channel. Now, as we move on through the year and the summer passes, people will still keep trying to make that journey. And the weather's going to be worse. The conditions are going to be worse. And then everyone will start talking about it. If there is 10 or 20 people who die in an mm. incident in the channel, and then, you know, it's, it's going back to what I said before about the incels and, and what happened with Jake Davison. Mm. We only started talking about the problems to mm. do with that when there's bloodshed. Yeah. Mm. And we don't want to get that far. But unfortunately, there's only people like Mercy and Nigel and talking on this channel about it where, where, where that conversation is being had and politicians are scared of it. And that's mm. what we need to get over. Why are they afraid of this topic? Well, because they're all scared of being told they're racist, aren't they? You know, if, if you had the word migrant on a front page headline mm. sometimes, and then ad, ad, advertisers don't like it as well in newspapers and on TV channels, and we've seen that already in various places, and just simply for having the use of the word migrant, they think, oh, no, that's, that's racist, they're refugees, or whatever they are, they're human beings, and mm, they need to be sure. treated well, and they need somewhere mm. safe to live, obviously. But we have to have the conversation, and that's been shut down. So mm. we need some politicians with spines, is what you're well, saying. That, seems, that well, seems to be it, yeah. Well, Pretty Patel is attempting to do it, but then, of course, it's that whole thing again of being called a racist if mm. you dare to try and say well hold on a minute and actually question what is going on let's hope that they will actually start to focus on it and of course with what's happening in Afghanistan now we're going to have to seriously look at bringing people out of that country mm. having a quota and actually taking people who are actually refugees and bringing them to this country we did it years ago with kinder transport we can do it again there's no 
problem with that. Mm. So we're moving on, though. What about this? Now, I watched this and I thought it was sensational. Wasn't yeah. it? Dan having a chat with Meghan Markle's dad. Indeed. Well, talking of accusations of racism, this is Thomas Markle, Meghan Markle's father, um, in a very candid interview with Dan Wharton earlier in the week, wasn't it? I mean, my, my <laughs> goodness, he had sipped the truth juice and... Um, <laughs> He, and he was and he was saying kind of how classless and unforgivable and embarrassing it was the accusations that Meghan and Harry kind of leveled against the royal family in the other very candid interview that happened this year which was the Meghan and Harry and Oprah loving um, and and Dan was kind of coaxing all manner of news lines out of him but this was one of my favorite clips <laughs> do you think Obama's right to side with William over Harry and Meghan if that's what he's done I, I think uh, Obama's absolutely right. I think uh, so many people are right now because both Meghan and Harry are attacking the royal family from both the, and uh, and um, for God's sakes, attacking uh, a 95-year-old uh, grandmother, great-grandmother, uh, is unforgivable. Uh, and uh, none of the rest of the world have... Uh, have Deserve what they've been they've been shoveled out either. It's it's, uh, it's it's embarrassing that they're doing this. It's embarrassing for them to be telling me about a few years ago never talk to the press and they spend three hours on a show with Oprah well, where uh, Harry claims that he's reclaiming his mental illness. Uh, we, 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 he's curing getting curing himself. From this mental illness uh, is a joke. Mm. Yes, I watched the entire thing and I thought, wow. I mean, he did point out, and, and, and it's good because he actually started to talk about lots of the inaccuracies that were in that particular interview, mm. and one of being, obviously, the fact that they said she said they were married three days before, mm. and they weren't. I mean, it's just... I mean, I do think with a dad like that, I kind of understand why she's maybe not that keen to reconcile, <laughs> you know, if he's so keen to get on his shonky webcam and talk to Dan Wooden about the kind of ins and outs of their relationship. <laughs> no, that adds to it. A lot you know, <laughs> you know, with that tabloid head on. You, uh, I mean, obviously, it's not it's totally unedifying, and no one. You know, I'll get the, the, that bit out of the way. Oh, it's awful. But we love to watch. Oh yeah. It, don't oh, we? yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, but then the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I mean, they're all at it, aren't they? Frankly. Well, this seems to be. Yes, yeah. the, the royal family have not had the greatest of years uh, as, as a result of this. But long live Thomas Markle popping up on his uh, shonky webcam yeah. and talking to Dan Wharton. Yeah. <laughs> you think as he's enlightening, he could have been better lit than that? Well, quite, quite, <laughs> really. Or maybe we needed to pay a higher fee. I don't know. Um, when well, just, just finally, um, this is a really heartbreaking story, and I think it will kind of you will all um, get very infuriated about this one. This is Ellie Costello. She's a um, southeast of England reporter. She interviewed uh, Siobhan Mead and Sean Dilly, who are a blind couple who have been turned away and refused entry to various venues in Essex um, because they've got guide dogs. They're both legally blind and because they had dogs with them, they weren't allowed into some of their favourite restaurants and pubs. And it was just a really heartbreaking um, and sad interview and one that I just wanted to highlight because it makes your blood boil, doesn't it? Things like that. I felt absolutely deflated. I felt so upset, humiliated. I felt embarrassed. Again, it's kind of reliving the moments when I actually lost all of my remaining vision at 16 years old, thinking I'm having to explain again to people that I am blind in front of people I don't know, disclosing my disability. And guide dogs are visible. They wear a harness, they're fully marked up, uh, and any assistance dog will wear uh, some form of uniform. So again, I just felt crushed because it's, it was two, two separate restaurants. And even now, reliving the moments of being refused, it's just shocking in 2021. Mm. What do you want to change looking forward? I mean, this happened twice on a Sunday. Um, what do you want to change briefly? I want there to be tougher penalties for services and restaurants uh, and businesses who refuse access to guide and assistance dogs and to raise awareness that this is unlawful.
Well, those two restaurants have apologised. They did issue apologies straight away, but the point is it shouldn't have happened at all. Those two restaurants, Little Italy and Jollibee in Leicester Square. Uh, Jollibee have actually uh, given us a statement. All our staff are trained on the rules regarding the entry of guide dogs into our stores. However, it is clear we need to revisit our training. Um, it is quite clear, yes. So Siobhan is hoping that it won't happen to, uh, to other people again um, because of the way that you're feeling. Um, and she wants to raise awareness uh, that this is still happening in 2021 uh, for people who work with guide dogs. Well, that, that was an interesting, that was on breakfast. Mm. Becca, thank you so much for joining us. Always good to thank talk you. to you. Interesting stuff.